for the next talk, we welcome a contribution to the ever-expanding zoo of malware in the ecosystem of insecurity, uh, Peg Pegasus. Uh, it's about the case of Ahmed Mansour. The Citizen Lab does excellent work in forensics and it even made it into the Christian Science Monitor lately. <laughs> And uh, a big round of applause for Bill Marzek and John Scott Railton. Thanks. Hello, everyone. Can you hear us? Awesome. Where's my clicker? So, my name is John Scott Relton, and I'm here with my colleague Bill Marzak, and we are going to present a talk titled Million Dollar Dissidents and the rest of us. Bill Marzak is a senior fellow at the Citizen Lab. He just got his PhD like last week at UC Berkeley, so a quick round of applause. And Bill is also one of the founding members of Bahrain Watch, which does really important work on human rights transparency and defense in the Gulf. Thank you for that uh, lovely introduction, John. Uh, my colleague, John Scott Railton, of course, is my co-conspirator at the Citizen Lab. Uh, he's also pursuing his PhD at UCLA, um, and his research focuses on targeted threats specifically against civil society. So for those of you who don't know the Citizen Lab, it's located in this big stone building in Toronto. Uh, we do two basic components of work. We look at targeted threats, against civil society, and then we look at information controls. And what we're going to talk about in this presentation is our work on targeted threats. Some background about the lab. It's fairly old in computer terms. It's independent. It's academic. And our bread and butter is developing long-form trust relationships with targeted groups to find things and then combining that with a real degree of technical rigor to understand what it is that we've found, whether it's phishing or other forms of attack. So, quick roadmap. I'm going to talk to you today, along with my colleague Bill, about two attacks. One, O'Day. We're going to talk about some infrastructure fingerprinting. We're going to talk about scale issues for security in high-risk users, and we're going to end on that. All right, so let's jump right into the story. Uh, this handsome gentleman here is called Rory Dunaghy, and he's a human rights activist based in the UK. He's a founding member of this organization, the Emirates Center for Human Rights, that focuses on, you guessed it, human rights in the UAE. He's also now a journalist at Middle East Eye, where he's been publishing a series of stories involving leaked emails from high-ranking members of the UAE government. Recently, uh, he was targeted. Uh, he actually got this interesting email here uh, from an address, uh, the right to fight at openmailbox.org. Okay, seems a bit sketchy. Uh, says, Mr. Donaghy, we are currently organizing a panel of experts. We invite you to apply to be a member. Uh, and you should, you should respond with your thoughts about the following article. And there's a link here uh, to this, this weird looking site, right? Axe.me. Um, you know, it looks kind of sketchy, right? Yeah, but at this point, somebody in the audience is probably thinking to themselves, oh man, it's another talk, activists somewhere getting social engineered and fished. Like, haven't I seen this talk many, many times before? Well, uh, that's a great point, John, but keep your shirt on. We're getting to some interesting stuff. <laughs> All right, so Axe.me was kind of weird, right? We started looking more into this site we figured out that it was this thing that claimed to be a service where you could shorten URLs, kind of like bit.ly or you know, something like this. Um, it turns out, though, that it was publicly accessible. So anybody could go here and shorten a URL that they wanted. Um, it would redirect using just a regular HTTP 302. But the link that was sent to Dunaghy actually redirected using a different mechanism, which ran a ton of JavaScript. If he clicked on it, it would have run a ton of JavaScript on his computer, including uh, a bunch of attacks uh, that would seek to de-anonymize him if he was using Tor. Uh, one particular attack was able to figure out the location where Tor browser bundle was installed, which could contain the name of the, of the person using it. Also, there was a, a really clever technique to do a local port scan of his computer to identify uh, which antivirus program he was using in order to perhaps enable uh, bypassing antiviruses. Um, 
So he, he'd received this email. We looked into this, this weird axe.me site, right? Um, the interesting thing was uh, we were actually able to get more from this attacker. So we instructed Dunaghy to send a response saying, thanks, thanks for your message, but I'm having trouble with your link. So this, this uh, case was actually really unusual because the attacker did, in fact, respond with this email. And they said, hey, we, we apologize for, for you having problems. Um, here's another link where you can download our organizational information as an attachment, as a file. Um, but the catch is we, we're such a secret organization, we had to protect it with macro-enabled security, right? Um, so it requests Dunaghy to please enable macros to, to view the, the information about the organization, right? So this is the image that he was presented with when he opened up the, the Word document. It says, this document is secured, please enable macros to continue. And it says, it says the same thing in Arabic. And it's got, you know, it looks official, right? It's got the Office 365 logo. It's got the Proofpoint logo. Like, those guys do document security. Okay, um, this is a pretty good, pretty good fish so far. So, so what did the macro do? Obviously, it, it displayed information, but that wasn't the only thing it did. So it turns out it was a pretty basic uh, PowerShell macro, or a macro that ran a PowerShell command. And the PowerShell command was designed to gather basic system information, as well as, interestingly, the installed version of .NET. And it submitted this, all this information to a kind of interesting-looking site, adhostingcache.com, and pulled a response back from the server, which was then executed in PowerShell. So we got this, this stage two response from the server, which actually installed a scheduled task in Windows, and every hour it pulled new commands from the server and executed them. But it was actually a different server, uh, encapsulawebcache.com. Um, and then, so, the third stage, the, the commands pulled down by the stage two, we were actually able to get some of these. And they appeared to be, it, the first command was getting the ARP table, um, which contained perhaps information about other machines locally connected to the network to perhaps enable lateral movement by the attacker. Um, and also very, very aggressively scrape the computer for passwords and, and browsing data using, in fact, uh, GPLv3 licensed code. Nobody tell uh, Richard Stallman. Um, from, from this application called Quasar Rat. All right, Bill, phishing, PowerShell, macros. I'm still kind of skeptical that this is going somewhere interesting. <laughs> well, you're right, it's technically boring, uh, but it actually, this sort of technique keeps working. Activists keep getting compromised. It just sounds to me like more user error. Well, in fact, John, this looks kind of like a digital public health problem. Indeed it does. So. As we've worked with, with targeted groups for uh, a good chunk of the last decade, one of the things we've observed is that the internet, surprising no one, has profoundly reduced asymmetries in the ability of individuals and organizations to communicate and broadcast their information, right? The advantage, the, the story I always think of is like, in a coup d'etat used to be, you know, the rebels had to capture the TV station, now everyone can have something like that. Um, so it's very exciting, and it's profoundly changed the way that civil society does its communication. But there's a great overhang, because that technology has not itself changed the underlying asymmetries of risk and power that are still articulated through the internet. What that means in practice is that civil society is really vulnerable. And it's made more so because most civil society organizations, most NGOs, are like the ultimate bring-your-own-device bring your own computing style, computing environment. There's absolutely no IT department. There's no choke point on the network that you can monitor. Most people have very mixed, even artisanal relationships um, to their security, and little access um, to behavior if you're trying to change behaviors. And usually documentation of bad things is terrible. Put differently, it's a big headache to try to do security. And the reason is not some kind of moral or ethical deficiency. It's that people are really strapped for time and resources and knowledge and are trying to focus on their primary objective, which is usually not securing their boxes. The predictable result, of course, of all of this is a hidden and sometimes not so hidden epidemic of compromises within civil society. So what happened to the story we were telling? Well, so that story about macros and PowerShell will actually lead us to an iOS zero day. All right. I'm interested, Bill. 
Okay, let's break it down, John. Okay, so we published the information about Rory Dunaghy and his targeting in a Citizen Lab report. Um, you can read about it. As part of this, we were able to trace the stage one and stage two domains, ad hosting cache and Encapsula web cache, to 11 and 69 other domain names, respectively. And now once we had this, the next question was, could we trace it even further? So we started looking at you know, the who is information for these domain names, as well as a bunch of uh, their DNS records, uh, specifically the SOA, the start of authority uh, DNS record. And we noticed something quite interesting. We noticed this email address, pn1p, pn1g3p at sigaint.org, um, and it was pointed to by one of the stage two domains we had found but also by three other domains which we had no idea what they were. They didn't match our fingerprints for stage one or stage two of the spyware. In fact, we determined they were designed to impersonate this website, uh, Asrar Arabia, or uh, Arabian Secrets, which is actually a, a legitimate news site that provides news and gossip about stories going on uh, in the Middle East. We were able to get the contents of these sites. You know, we just went to visit these websites and found the following uh, code, the following HTML code returned by the sites. As you can see, what's going on here is they're showing the legitimate uh, Aswar Arabia website to the user in an iframe that takes up the whole browser window. And there's also this invisible one-by-one -one iframe uh, loading this weird-looking site, smser.net slash a bunch of numbers. Very weird. Um, so we began kind of investigating this. We looked at this link specifically. We found that it redirected to smser.net slash redirect.aspx, which returned this, this uh, HTML code. And you can see this is kind of weird. It's, it's got a very distinctive format. Uh, there's two meta redirects to Google, and there's kind of like a blank you know, title and a blank body. Um, it struck us as very odd. So we use this as a fingerprint and, in fact, scan the entire internet looking for this same fingerprint. Specifically, we use ZMAP. Uh, we use ZMAP to scan the entire internet doing a get request for redirect.aspx on every server on port 80. And we found, actually, 149 IP addresses mapping to 149 domain names, which returned this same code, only 149. So this struck us as, as kind, of, kind of odd, the fact, you know, maybe we were onto something important. We then began breaking down and looking at exactly what those domain names we found were. We found that a couple of them were designed to impersonate, uh, for example, government portals uh, or humanitarian organizations like the Red Cross um, or airlines, news media, and a bunch of other different categories. But the theme that struck us was impersonation. You can see here some of the typos like, uh, aljazeera.co instead of aljazeera. Um, another thing we noticed is that some of the domains had SMS in them over and over and over. And this struck us as odd, right? Why would you have a bunch of domain names that are impersonating things and a bunch of other related domain names with SMS in the name? Well, maybe if you're targeting mobile phones and people get, you know, some sort of link that has, you know, SMS in it, maybe they're more likely to click on it. So we, at this point, we figured maybe these domain names, these 149 domain names, were designed to target mobile phones. So we waited and we asked around. One of the key features of the way that Citizen Lab does its work is that it often leaves us with big questions and watching. So to think about our workflow, it often involves encountering a group that's received something suspicious. We take a look at what they've received, we often find some command and control infrastructure, and then we look and we wait and we poke. And at the same time, we will develop fingerprints for that C2 infrastructure and start to get a better sense of where else it might be in IPv4 space. We'll then often go back, having found infrastructure, which is where we are in this story, and start looking for malware or something that talks to that infrastructure. And what we're doing is exploiting a fundamental principle, we think, of targeted surveillance using intrusion, which is when it's used at the scale of monitoring a group of people rather than a single intrusion, infrastructure is going to get used not just for one person, but for a bunch. That means that servers are going to stay online for a while. That means that there may be malware floating around. And this is really part of the enabling feature 
um, of this community for the work that we do. And it translates into interesting results. So in 2014, using fingerprints developed for the malware of hacking team, we came up with a list of suspected government users. Uh, in 2015, we did the same thing, updating earlier work on suspected government users of FinFisher. But um, back to waiting. In August of 2016, we got a message from Ahmed Mansour, who is, um, as was mentioned in the introduction, um, a human rights defender based in the UAE. Mansour said, guys, I think I'm being targeted again. And we believed him because in 2011, Mansour was targeted with FinFisher, um, a document, sorry, uh, an EXE disguised as a PDF. And then, nobody leaving well enough alone, he was targeted again with a hacking team implant in 2012, this time with an attack document and some old day. So, we paid attention. What he had for us was two SMS messages that he had received, basically translating to new secrets about Emiratis tortured in state prisons. Something relevant to his work, not only as a human rights defender, but to him personally, as he's previously been arrested and jailed for his highly important work. So we said, nice bait. We'll take it. <laughs> So, as John said, we decided to, to take this bait. We decided to somehow see what was behind these links that Mansour had sent us in the text messages. So what did we do? Well, we actually figured, hey, let's open these up on an iPhone. He received the links on his iPhone 6. So we said, okay, we've, we've got an iPhone. Uh, let's, let's factory reset it, and let's uh, connect it to the internet through a laptop. Since the link was using HTTPS, we wanted to capture everything, so we set up a laptop with uh, MITM proxy and Wireshark, um, and basically installed the, the, our fake root cert on the iPhone uh, and transcribed the link uh, into Safari on our iPhone. Uh, so all of phone's internet traffic was going through the laptop, we could see everything, and our goal was to kind of capture what might be behind this. So what happens next will shock you. All right, so this is the output from Wireshark that we were seeing on our, our laptop. So the first thing, obviously, you know, we, we transcribed the link, we typed it in, we see what you'd expect, a get request for the link. And it turned out this was a blob of, of obfuscated JavaScript, which already was, was quite interesting. The next thing we saw is that about 10 seconds after we typed it in, the Safari window on the iPhone closed. Very weird, very unusual. This was our first indication that, okay, you know, maybe there is some sort of, some sort of shenanigans going on here with this, with this, with this link. We saw then the phone sent out another request for this file final 111, which was a second stage, uh, of, you know, lightly obfuscated shellcode. Um, a bunch of other requests appeared, you know, to emanate from the phone, giving basically like logging data or the status of what was going on to the server. Um, and then we saw a, a message saying, trying to download bundle. In other words, the phone sent a log message to the server saying that it was trying to download something. And it was trying to download this file, test111.tar, uh, which actually was, was an iPhone application. And the interesting thing is that this request came from a non-Safari user agent, telling us that control had been transferred, perhaps, to some other process on the phone, which was, which was fetching this. So, hold on, Bill. Are we looking at some kind of remote jailbreak? Well, that was kind of what we thought. We thought we might be looking at that, indeed. So, um, what exactly did we get? Well, um, it turned out that what we had seen was the result of, of three zero-day exploits. Uh, the first, an exploit in Safari, um, and the second two exploits designed to uh, jailbreak and install an app uh, on the phone. The payload that it installed was uh, actually capable of recording uh, messages, voice, and all kinds of other data from a number of apps uh, on the phone. 
And uh, for those of you uh, who have been attending CCC, um, we gave the uh, artifacts that we'd received to our friends at Lookout. Uh, and this handsome gentleman here, Max Bazili, gave an excellent talk on the internals of the exploits uh, and the jailbreak uh, on day one of CCC. So I hope you all check that out. If not, you can, uh, you can watch it online. So, of course, um, we also realized, uh, along with Lookout, that it was time to do some responsible disclosure towards Apple, which we did. What is, of course, interesting is that this was the first known, so the first publicly announced remote iOS jailbreak. Pretty exciting. And these are things that in no way come cheap. Most recently, we learned um, that Zerodium is offering a $1.5 million bounty for a similar piece of technology. But this has also caught the attention of the popular media, even Vanity Fair, which published an article asking, who's stealing the secrets of Silicon Valley's crown jewel? So, who did hack Silicon Valley's crown jewel? Right, right, so we've told you what we've got. We got the remote jailbreak, we got the interesting spyware, but who's behind it? So remember we did this uh, scan, we used ZMAP, we found these 149 IP addresses that were related to that, that weird site, smser.net. So that didn't really help us in attribution. We got these you know, IP addresses, we got these domain names, there were no clues, really. So the natural next step is we decided to go back in time. And of course, we didn't actually go back in time, we simply used historical internet scanning data, and we looked up those 149 IPs. How did they behave in the past? We found out that 19 of these 149 IPs actually gave a different response in the past to a, a GET request on port 80. And it was this other weird, odd-looking Google redirect. You can see, you know, there's like the, the Unicode byte order mark at the beginning. You know, there's like some weird line breaks in there. Um, looks pretty odd. And of course, we've got the, the blank title and, and blank body. So this was very interesting. And the next natural question was, okay, 19 IP addresses return this. How many, others, how many other ones return the same response in that historical scanning data? So we found that it was returned by about 85 or so other IP addresses, including, including IP addresses pointed to by three interesting domain names, nsoqa.com, qaintqa.com, and mail1.nsogroup.com. And NSO Group, of course, is a spyware vendor based in Israel. This is a screenshot of their product brochure showing uh, that they do indeed control the domain name nsogroup.com. And in fact, the first two domain names listed there are also registered to people with nsogroup.com email addresses. So NSO Group's brochure mentions that it's a uh, leader in the field of cyber warfare. Um, they have this solution called Pegasus, which allows full monitoring and exfiltration from phones, and it's exclusively for the use of government and law enforcement agencies. So, although Mansour was the first target we found, he wasn't the only one. Uh, this is Rafael Cabrera, a courageous Mexican journalist. And we got in touch with Cabrera after we learned that he'd been receiving suspicious text messages. So, uh, what were these messages? Well, they included things like a fake Facebook link, account, note, uh, account overage charges, um, uh, news alerts related to his work, and then, bizarrely, just crude sexual taunts followed by a link. Why anyone would click on that is beyond me. Why was he targeted? Well, it turned out that the links were either shortened links going directly to the infrastructure that we had found or directly pointing at that infrastructure. Now, our guess is that this may have something to do with his work on the Casablanca scandal. So the Casablanca scandal, in brief, is the discovery that the now president of Mexico, formerly a provincial governor, received during his provincial governorship a house paid for by a company that got a concession to do an infrastructure project during his tenure as governor, widely believed to be an example of corruption. But this wasn't the only case either. In the course of our scanning, we found evidence of targeting across the globe, from Mexico and the UAE, to Uzbekistan, Kenya, Mozambique, Qatar, Turkey, Morocco, Hungary, and elsewhere. 
Now, of course, the question is, what's all this targeting, right? Well, if you listen to the chief counsel of Hacking Team, a company that sells this kind of stuff, he would have you believe that these, and this is a quote, that this is designed to target terrorists, pornographers, and other criminals. We could refer to this as le fig leaf. In fact, our research turns up again and again evidence of this technology being used, perhaps for some law enforcement purposes, but also pointed at the political opponents and critics of powerful regimes, journalists, activists, and human rights defenders. So who are these people? Well, let's give you a thumbnail sketch. Hisham, a human rights defender from Morocco, one of the few free voices during the time that he ran an organization systematically prosecuted by the government, his organization, Mumfa Kinch, was targeted with commercial malware, work done by Bill, Morgan Marquis Boar, and others, including Claudia, uh, who's here somewhere. Um, we have an Ethiopian journalist based in the US. Um, he and his news organization were targeted by, we believe, the Ethiopian government in the process of reporting on that country. So clear evidence, this kind of spyware in no way reflects borders. It certainly doesn't respect them. Carlos Figueroa, an opposition politician in Ecuador, and of course, Ahmed Mansour. What's interesting about each of these people is that they are, in our view, million-dollar dissidents. The cost of these programs is, in effect, price-tagging the power of their speech in the eyes of the governments uh, who are scared of them. So we have this thing that we bandy around in the lab, which is this idea of the principle of misuse. Basically, commercial surveillance technology, including intrusion tools and zero days, will be misused in proportion to the lack of accountability and oversight. This is in no way a new discovery. This is something that history has shown us time and time again with different regimes. Our view is that the current spyware market is just fully proving that history repeats itself. That said, there are some saliency issues. So as Claudio pointed out yesterday, surveillance technology that's sold by companies gets a lot of attention. And the specific companies who sell it get a lot of attention, whether or not they happen to be representative. This is especially true when zero-day exploits are involved. And it's also the case that this is only part of the threat to civil society. So here's some thumbnail bar charts. The point that I'm gonna make with them is basically this. The lion's share of the malware attacks that we look at and that we see at the Citizen Lab, so note there's a potential selection bias, there's some we don't, emphasize high social engineering sophistication and minimum necessary technical sophistication. You don't need a really fancy lockpick if you can climb through an open window. Some numbers to back this up. Here's some rigorous work done by my colleagues and I, tracking thousands of attacks against civil society organizations worked in, working in Tibet, as one example. And what we see when we track which exploits are used is a proliferation of old days and very few zero days. This pattern is fairly common. But that's, of course, not the whole story. And by no means would I argue that you shouldn't pay attention to commercial surveillance. Right, right. As John says, you know, threat actors tend to focus on the easiest way to get in. However, sometimes the easiest way to get in is a zero-day exploit uh, using these commercial surveillance tools. And commercial surveillance tools are, do receive a lot of attention, but I think it's important also to, to focus on these because uh, commercial surveillance is not just uh, the surveillance tool. It's really exporting all of the expertise uh, to, to run a well-resourced surveillance state. If you look at companies that operate in this space, like FinFisher, for example, they don't just sell you the spyware. Uh, they do sell you the spyware, of course, but they also sell you the support, and they sell you the training. Um, and what is this? This is essentially updates to get around new security measures and antivirus programs. And if you don't know how to hack or fish, they'll teach you how to do that too. So these vendors are not just selling the tools, they're also, prolifer they're also facilitating the proliferation of the surveillance state. 
So one of the bigger picture problems that we've got as we're thinking about how to defend against this stuff is the following problem. You don't know who the next activists are going to be. They don't even know themselves. And so the question is, how in an environment where everyone is mostly using commercial platforms and tools for their communication, even their most sensitive communication, how do you secure this world? Well, one potential strategy is to make us all, if you'll forgive the hyperbolic language, potential million-dollar dissidents. Put differently, this means raising the cost to target an arbitrary person. So how do you do that? Well, there is the iPhone model, right, which is you create a walled garden, and you make it very, very hard for users to do certain activities. So you trade some user freedoms in exchange for security. We see elements of this model throughout for example, as Chris Segoyan correctly pointed out yesterday, Chrome, extremely secure browser, trades user security for a degree of privacy. One of the challenges of this space is that companies have done a really efficient job at attracting people who are activists, at attracting people who are going to use these tools in ways that are politically sensitive. And many who face serious threats or will one day are using a Gmail inbox right now or something similar. These are not tools currently designed to handle high risk. They happen to be the most fluid tools for most user experiences. But even in these environments, one of the challenges is that the kinds of security options that would protect these groups are not default enabled, say, during the account creation process. A really good example of this would be two-factor authentication. Another is browser sandboxing, complete sandboxing as a norm across the industry. So that's a little bit what we think industry players can do, but what can you folks do in the audience? So thanks, John. You raised some very good points about w ways to raise the cost across the bar of these sorts of attacks. And that's an important big picture consideration. So another thing, and one of the areas where specifically we work at the Citizen Lab, is looking also not just at the forest, but at the, at the individual trees themselves. And pardon the expression, they're not, they're not trees, they're actual real people who are being targeted with this, with this spyware. Um, and the questions we try and answer are, who are these high-risk users and how are they actually being targeted in the real world? So, as we mentioned earlier, we build these deep relationships and engage with, with activists and civil society groups. And we encourage them to forward anything suspicious that they have and, and send it to us. So the starting point for all these investigations, as, as you saw at the beginning of our talk, is some sort of suspicious or suspected malicious digital artifact, be it an email, a message, a link, a file. Um, and then we, we aim to answer the questions, of course, is it an attack? Uh, how is the attack happening? Who's conducting the attack? Who's the attacker? And what else is the attacker doing? Can we trace and look at their other activities? So, of course, you know, uh, we, we do this at the Citizen Lab. You know, we, we've presented some cases from the UAE. Um, and, you know, my colleague John has done a lot of great work on this. But uh, if we, you know, look at our John here on the map. So... <laughs> John is, is but one, one person, and he's a, he's a very, very uh, smart, uh, very, very talented, very, very hardworking person. <laughs> Bill did this when I was sleeping last night. <laughs> <laughs> but despite John's best efforts, there's no way we can get you know, John to cover the entire world. John doesn't have enough hours in the day to interface with all of the potentially targeted groups and do this work across the world. So really, um, you know, whoops. <laughs> so really, the issue is that we need more people working in this field, more people, you know, doing either the Citizen Lab model that I described or working with organizations like, like Claudio's Security Without Borders or similar efforts to try and not just work on, you know, raising the cost across the board, but also focus on these individual cases which illuminate the, the big picture as a whole. So, We'd like to conclude by just offering a few thoughts from, from Mansoor himself, uh, being the main subject of our talk. We asked him if there was anything that he'd like to, to give to the tech community or to the world. And the message that he, that he wants to convey is that uh, defending human rights, uh, in his view, is becoming more and more uh, difficult. 
Uh, so the work that he does tries to communicate with victims and you know, connect victims with the international media to raise their cases and raise awareness of human rights violations. And that's becoming increasingly dangerous because the governments, like his government in the UAE, are increasingly retaliating in ever more brutal ways. For instance, Mansour himself has been subject to beatings and arrests. Um, you know, his, his car was confiscated, his passport was confiscated. The uh, suspected uh, to be the government stole uh, about $100,000 from his account, his bank account. Uh, so, so these retaliations can, in some cases, be, be very brutal. Um, and once the technology reaches these governments like the UAE, he's certain that it will be abused and used to target, uh, you know, dissidents, activists, and, and other people who are just exercising legitimate freedom of expression rights. So he implores uh, the international community and technologists to try and do whatever they can to make sure that these sorts of dangerous technologies like Hacking Team, like NSO, like Finn Fisher, do not make it into the hands of repressive regimes in the first place. So with that, we'd like to close on some quick acknowledgements to some amazing colleagues, but first thanking the organizers of this event for having us. We really appreciate that and running the event so excellently. Um, none of our work works very well without the close collaboration of a bunch of amazing colleagues, Ron Diebert, Sarah McCune, Claudia Guarneri, Adam Senft, Irene Peranto, Masashi Nishihara, um, Morgan Marquis Boar, who did some of the amazing work on tracking malware um, from governments, uh, the team at Lookout, um, especially Max, uh, Apple Inc., who worked with us very carefully to do the disclosure process, um, and a lot of other researchers, including Seth Hardy, um, who have been tremendously helpful to us as we've done this work. And finally, closing um, on thanking Passive Total. Um, so with that, I'd like to open it up for questions from the audience. If folks have burning things you'd like to ask us, we would love to answer. I see already a question at number four, so jump right in. Fortune favors the brave. Um, so there have been attempts to, to restrict um, the distribution of these kind of tools through the, the Wassenaar arrangement. Do you feel that that is the best way to do this? Well, I think what we can say is that our work on NSO shows that the current arrangement is wholly under-resourced for stopping the proliferation of these tools. Um, and I think I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I think it's also uh, interesting to kind of look at how the efforts have been focused so far, um, you know, sp specifically on, on in, you know, intrusion tools and zero-day exploits, um, but also, you know, looking at what the key salient characteristic of these organizations like FinFisher, NSO, and Hacking Team are. And in my view, the, the key characteristic is that they don't just give you the tools, because, you know, anybody can, can give you the tools. What they do is they hold your hand while you use them. They give you support. They give you training. Uh, it's this complete package that really, you know, can, can bootstrap a government from, from no knowledge to, you know, getting information from, from activists' phones and computers quickly. Yeah. And I think I'll also just observe, as somebody recently pointed out to me, some form of additional regulation is probably in the pipeline. And we probably want to make sure as a community that we are as engaged as possible in ensuring that that regulation works and works for us um, and uh, is balanced. Question on the two. Have you been uh, profiling what devices, what platforms are being targeted? And do you have any idea if, if as a gov government do you want to pay I don't know, a huge amount of money, you have to know which platform to target. So how is it being done? How, how do you target your people and platforms? Well, great question. It really depends on the case. I think in a lot of sophisticated attacks, we see elements of profiling before targeting. In other cases, and Bill can speak to this, um, the exploit servers that we look at actually um, select and fire based on what device you touch. Yeah, so companies like like NSO or like Hacking Team and probably Finn Fisher too offer exploit services. So, you know, the government that's targeting you can create some sort of link and the link dynamically, you know, sees what platform you're on, perhaps based on, you know, the user agent header or other headers in your in your request um, and then delivers the appropriate, you know, spyware payload for, for whatever your device is. Um, but, you know, I think from when when 
you know, a government is thinking about this, when an attacker is thinking, hey, what, what platforms do I want? You know, they can perhaps leverage some intelligence from their country, you know, yeah. seeing which are the most common platforms in their country. Um, but perhaps maybe the smarter attackers would think and say, oh, maybe it's not really about the platform, it's about the information. Where is the information? And what, what are the other ways I can get at the information? Maybe it's, maybe you want to access someone's email account. And the way, the easiest way to do that would be, phishing rather right. than, you know, targeting a specific platform. Or maybe there's, you know, files on someone's device that you want. And in that case, you've, you've got to hit that device. Yeah. The flip side, of course, is cyber militia-like groups. So the My Cousin Knows Computers approach to doing malware, lots of commercial rats. Those groups will often target what they see as most popular in the communities that they're targeting. Uh, question over Hi, there. Hi, thank you for the talk. I would like to ask you two question, questions. One is, is there any metric to know all of these tools, how many of them were used for uh, actual um, criminal activities in, in, a, in a position to just like dissidents? And the second question is, is that uh, if maybe without this technology, the tools that these government would use would be more dangerous to these activists? Like, could they like operate spies or just like lock them up? Yeah. Maybe it's... Like, it's a bad thing overall, but maybe it's better than the alternative. So these are really interesting questions. Bill, do you want to go first? Yep. And then I'll say something. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so, yeah. No, that, so with respect to your second question, I think it's, it's definitely an, an interesting point. Like, if this technology wasn't available, maybe they'd be, you know, more brutal. Um, I think, you know, it, it, it speaks to, like, I think a fundamental philosophical argument, right? Do you kind of look at, at what's going on and see something bad happening and, and try and stop that, you know, see what you can do to try and make things better? Or do you, you know, kind of like think several steps down the line and, well, if I do this, maybe they'll do that. Um, you know, I think, and at least from my point of view, I think, you know, what we want to be doing is, you know, identifying harms and wrongs that are happening and then trying to go after those directly. And then if, you know, the government starts, you know, torturing people in response, um, you know, that's an additional thing that we advocate on and try and try and stop. Um, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that, John? Yeah, I think that, you know, the, the elegant way to look at this is that um, states are very attracted to intrusion software. And nothing you're going to do is going to change that because more and more communications are encrypted and many of their targets are not within their borders. And so I think the model should be raise the cost to engage in those practices. You can't stop it, and you probably can't legislate it out of existence. But the more the cost is raised through all these different means, whether it's more secure devices, whether it's better norms in the community so people are less attracted to the bright, shiny things of uh, selling bugs to these brokers, um, uh, or whether it's working on behavior, um, you want to increase cost. Question on one. Uh, the majority of tax, as you know, don't use fancy O-Day exploit chains. They'll use shitty off-the-shelf rats. How do you hope to get the community and journalists to actually care about that? Because as a journalist, we're not going to write about another activist I getting guess. targeted by a shitty piece of malware, to be perfectly yeah. blunt, as John and I know. Yeah, yeah. well, I think sure. you know, we've had this conversation. For me, I think the question goes back to what the objective is. For us, the stories that are the most important are often the human stories of harm. And journalists, if they take the time, and their editors typically will have a nose for those. And so, in our view, the most important part of doing this work is finding ways to yield up real cases. That said, I can say candidly, we've noticed that editors sometimes, sort of without saying it in so many words, are tired of yet another story of activists being targeted in the Middle East. Um, this is a problem we struggle with. I think one way forward is a little bit sideways, which is finding cases where hacking and intrusion is used in cases closer to home. That doesn't just mean, you know, the Democratic Party or politicians. It could mean women who are victims of violence. Um, it could be uh, people who are being targeted or stalked. And I think more of those stories and more of those human stories will help. But it's an ongoing, it's an ongoing battle. It's why we're so pleased to be able to have an O-Day to talk about, to trot out these points. Um, but I think journalists also have a tremendous role to play. So just one thing to flag, middlemen in the industry. The relationship between a lot of these companies and countries is often not direct. In between, there's a middleman, an organization that provides them with a fig leaf of cover, which allows the company to say, we are not operational. 
we don't determine how our product is used, trying to absolve themselves of a lot of the liability. This often allows them to do things like skirt regulations or to try to get around export control agreements. As researchers at the Citizen Lab, we can track the command and control and we can link it to companies. We can track the malware and we can link it to victims. But we don't have a good technical means to study middlemen. So I think that's a very fruitful area for journalists and other investigators to dig in. I think also, I think also another uh, final important point, just to wrap up really quick, is uh, you know the cases that have received the most coverage. I think, at least in my experience from the press, are cases where you know you can actually kind of show a, a documented harm because of some case, because of some targeting. There, yeah. were, you know, some information was gained, someone was arrested, and there's a documented harm. Um, certainly, as you point out, from a technical journalist perspective, um, the stories that are going to be most interesting are the the sexy zero days, but but from a traditional journalistic perspective, I think you know these stories where you can make establish the causal link and say, hey, this this person was targeted with whatever doesn't have to be sexy, yeah. but they were targeted, and we can show that some information was taken and then used in some sort of way that that led to real world consequences. I think that is the holy grail for highlighting because at the end of the day, these the the important thing to highlight is. You know, the technology is a sideshow. The main thing is the person being targeted and experiencing the consequences for engaging in peaceful, legitimate freedom of expression activity. Yeah. Thank you. And in a sense, I think what we're talking about, you know, we use the term an epidemic of compromises. We're talking about a problem that looks a lot like a public health problem. And in the same way that public health has historically had trouble vis-a-vis -vis doctors who consider themselves experts and might have some views about patients needing to wash their hands or engaged in certain behaviors, the same problem holds true here. We see a lot of experts' eyes glaze over when we talk about attacks that use these simple tools, and yet they work. And in our mind, that's a perfect example of a public health-like problem. And we hope to get into a place with all of you where the norms make it acceptable to see this as just as complicated and exciting a set of problems, just having more parameters than a simple piece of malware. Can I bounce to the next question, or did you have a follow-up? Hey guys, thanks for the, for the great eye opener first. And uh, I have a question. I walk here around like two days, and also in my daily life, I see a lot of laptops with the stickers on the cameras or stickers on the on the mics. It really makes me laugh. But actually, it, it, it for me is just a, a, an indication that we don't trust our software vendors. Actually, is there have you ever thought about how how is there a community or something that we can see or audit somehow? the legitimacy or maybe the trustfulness of a software? This is an interesting and hard problem. I'm going to take your question to a slightly different direction and okay. say, I think we're in a place where a lot of people don't have a lot of trust, but especially for general users, don't necessarily know what they should be doing, what the low-hanging fruit is. So not the perfect trust, but the basic stuff. And what we see in our day-to-day -day is lots of activists and others who are not exactly nihilists, but don't really know where the correct sources of information should come from, what behaviors are worth their time, and what behaviors are too costly. And, you know, pictures, of, you know, stickers on laptop cameras do have the advantage of at least raising awareness. I think the big challenge, though, is in... Um, the fact that people will be looking to us as a community for easy things that they can do without a lot of judgment and without a lot of snarky, ah, just another user error. Um, and this is a really defining problem for us. <laughs> Bill, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, I just want to echo what, what you said, John. Um, you know, there's time and time again, like I'm struck by dissidents that I talk to and they, you know, mention all these kind of like, you know, homebrew things they, that they do. We call right? them artisanal security. Yeah, artisanal security, right? Where, where they'll say like, oh, well, you know, I have this crazy system where I keep swapping SIM cards in my phone to remain anonymous when making phone calls to different people. Or, you know, oh, I, I jailbroke my iPhone to install a second copy of WhatsApp so I can have an anonymous number and a non-anonymous <laughs> number on WhatsApp. Um, you know, so I think there's, there's a lot of perhaps, you know, of these misconceptions floating around. And, you know, in the, in the, the vacuum of legitimate authoritative sources of, of information yeah. like this, people kind of go to, well, here's how I think, you know, spying works. Here's how I think government surveillance works. And therefore I have this perhaps incorrect, you know, mental model of that. And then I'll, you know, 
unfortunately get to some sort of incorrect security precaution. Yeah. So I think, you know, this, this education is important, not just on, you know, like seven basic security tips that everyone should do, you know, something like that, but also, you know, get, you know, more longer term efforts to kind of teach people how this, how this works, like kind of, you know, not, you know, like, eight hour class or something, but kind of step them through maybe like an hour presentation, like, you know, how exactly does this work? What exactly should you be worried about in your threat model? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. A great question. Do we have other questions? If there is no other question, gentlemen, because you're always so swift, you deprived us of the opportunity to applause and thank you. And that's... Oh. <laughs> Um, and if the signal angel doesn't signal that there's a question, I think that was the end. Any more questions? <laughs> All right. All right. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. Oh, you know what? One thought to add, parting, parting observation. When we talk to civil society groups about digital security risk, one thing, it took a while to dawn on me, you know, white guy coming from North America talking to people about their problems somewhere else, agent of innocence in a lot of ways, right? A lot of naivete. And one of the things that I discovered is that people, of course, surprise, surprise, are constantly engaged in balancing the risks that they face in other domains. So non-governmental organizations are constantly thinking about the political risk of different choices. It's not that they aren't incapable of doing modeling of risk, they're often doing it. The challenge is how to help them port that thinking and that willingness to think about those problems into things technological. And I think we have a long way to go there. And one of the problems that we have is the perfect is often the enemy of the good. So a lot of the right recommendations that we might be tempted to um, you know, quickly make to someone, like, oh, well, you should use this particular security tool because it's secure, often not only don't quite mesh with their needs, but don't reflect the nuance with which they think about their own risks and the choices and balancing that they'll need to engage in. Yeah, I think yeah. there's one really interesting anecdote that I can tell that, that kind of crystallizes that from an individual user point of view. Um, so I work with some activists in Bahrain, and you know we heard a story a couple of years ago that uh, a bunch of activists were arrested by being traced through this messaging app that they were using, and it was a we analyzed it. It was an insecure messaging app called Zello, um, and basically. Uh, you know, so the, our first thought was like, okay, well, let's recommend that they use a secure messaging app. But the reason why they were actually using this insecure app was it was the only one they could find that provided a walkie-talkie functionality. And how they use this is that, you know, an activist would be, you know, asleep in his, in his bed. He'd have the, the phone beside his bed. And if there were the police coming in doing house raids and, and searches in the village, then someone would get on the walkie-talkie and broadcast the message to everyone. And it would wake up the sleeping people immediately, like, you know, dozens of people and say, you know, hey, there's police raids in the village, right? Um, and so they, they couldn't switch away from this because it was part of their model of avoiding the risk of being, you know, arrested by police. And this, you know, interception digital security risk was kind of, you know, ancillary in their, 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 their mindset to yeah. this, to this uh, you know, real world risk. So I think that's a great point. Um, great. Did, you, did you have anything you wanted to add? I think or? I'm good. All right. Guys, thank you so much for your time and attention. We really appreciate the welcome here. Thank you. Thank you.